Churchill's options that are before him. Everything's gone horribly wrong on the continent. The French are trying to get out of the war. Uh, Churchill's negotiating with Paul Reynolds. What is the next step? How can France get out of the war? Arguably, Britain comes closest to losing the Second World War is in that winter. There's talk of them giving up Malta, Gibraltar, uh, possibly Egypt. To Italy? Yes. I'm here at the Cabinet War Rooms in the heart of London, otherwise known as the Churchill War Rooms. It was here during the Second World War that Churchill and his cabinet would shelter from the bombs above, making key decisions about the war. You can visit the Churchill War Rooms today. You can even book a behind the scenes tour and stand in Churchill's bedroom itself. I'm here today to talk to Professor John Buckley about his new book, The Armchair General. And we're going to talk about some of the decisions that Churchill made and what might have happened if he hadn't risen to power. John, we are here in the Cabinet War Rooms, what's come to be known as the Churchill War Rooms due to their iconic role during the Second World War. But take us back to that pre-Churchill era, to that time when Chamberlain is in power. What is the mood in Parliament? What is the mood with the British people? It's one of those things that a lot of people forget that Chamberlain was Prime Minister for the first nine, ten months of the Second World War. We all seem to associate it with Churchill. Of course, Chamberlain's in charge, Churchill's just the First Lord of the Admiralty. Um, but the mood really starts to turn with the uh, Norwegian campaign. And there have been lots of questions about Chamberlain's allegiance prior to that point, but it all starts to fall apart at that point. Which is interesting because Churchill, of course, is significantly implicated in the Norwegian campaign, but he manages to evade responsibility and others look worse than him. So Chamberlain starts to come into severe criticism in April uh, of 1940. Um, and lots of question marks about whether he's the right person to lead the country at that time uh, start to emerge. And when those personnel coming back from the Norwegian campaign um, start to talk about what's happened, how badly mishandled it's been, pressure starts to grow. And so there's a growing disillusionment with Chamberlain's leadership at the beginning of May of 1940. Does Churchill start to use this to his advantage? Does he use the, the failures in Norway as a bit of a crowbar to get himself in the right position? Um, to a degree. I mean, he's a politician, so of course he's looking for the right moment and the right opportunity. But I think there are, there are wider issues at play, um, because at this stage Churchill is not the clear uh, successor to Chamberlain, um, and many others are vying for the position, there's talk of different people. Um, but it's, it's mainly about who is going to be the right person, who's the right personality. Chamberlain is still associated with appeasement and the policies and so on uh, of the late 1930s, and what that led to. Now, at this particular point in the war, they're looking for somebody who's got more of a dynamic grip. Chamberlain's possibly not that person. Take us back to that, that moment in time when Chamberlain is being tarred with this brush of appeasement. He's been tricked by Hitler. He's a bit of a fool. Is that fair or is this somebody who is genuinely on a quest for peace, wants to avoid that horror of the First World War that he knows all too well. And people seem to forget that. Mm -hmm. You know, this is someone that has this not only in his living memory, but has an experience mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. You know, is it unfair that we paint Chamberlain as the great appeaser? Um, it is to a degree, um, because he was seeking a way of avoiding another com uh, conflict similar to the First World War. We can understand why that's the case, what he's trying to achieve. Um, and now we look back on it as, in terms of appeasement and trying to do a deal as clearly the wrong policy. But we, we know that now at the time it was enormously popular. Keeping Britain out of the war uh, or avoiding another war with Germany was uh, hugely popular in, in Britain in the 1930s. And it's only really in the final few months when it becomes clear that the policy from Munich onwards has totally failed and that Germany is actually exploiting uh, what they have, uh, see as weakness that it all starts to unravel for him. But until that point, he's seen as somebody who's really kept Britain safe, um, emphasised peace, emphasised rebuilding and restructuring at home. Uh, yes, there are voices dissenting in terms of foreign policy, but not that many. So it's not that clear until those final few months 
um, that everything he's worked for is going to fall apart over the next seven, eight, nine months. Were there any other options? Now, your new book, The Armchair General, allows us to be put into that hot seat to have a look and to see what history might have been like had other people perhaps been in charge. Who were the other options if it hadn't been Churchill? The only other serious contender, I mean, others were talked about, there was even talk of Lloyd George making a comeback, of all people, um, but the only other serious contender was Lord Halifax. Now, Halifax was the Foreign Secretary, um, he'd been a, a senior position of government for many years, um, and he was talked about because he was the most senior and well-respected and liked figure within the Conservative Party. Um, there was, he, he carried himself with um, uh, great erudition, you know, he was a very, very positive person, um, clearly in charge, one of the kind of patrician, old-style Tory aristocrats. Yes, very much so, and that's how it was viewed at the time. You want somebody who's sensible, rational, and so on, who's going to take over. And he was very popular with the, in the Conservative Party, um, whereas, interestingly, Churchill was not. Um, Churchill was more widely known, had a greater respect outside for all of his uh, arguments against Nazism and against Hitler in the late 1930s, which Halifax had also started to recognise. He was not in favour of the Munich Agreement, so let's not paint him as a complete appeaser. Um, but Churchill had this wider appeal, Halifax had the appeal particularly with the Conservative Party. We have to bear in mind the Conservatives are the dominant party by some distance in the House of Commons in 1940. So when those question marks start to grow against Chamberlain's leadership, it's Halifax who seems the most likely option at that time. So why doesn't Halifax come to power? Does he not have the popularity with the British people? Do they think that he's uh, akin to Chamberlain's policies? The, the reason, perhaps, and it is much mythologised, which is often with these cases, about a, a big meeting on the 9th of May. Uh, Chamberlain um, is still hopeful that he can continue as Prime Minister, but there's a growing body of opinion that maybe it's time for him to step aside. But there is a meeting on the 9th of May at 10 Downing Street where Churchill, Halifax, uh, Chamberlain and the Chief Whip, David Margeson, always an important character in, in these uh, decisions, meet up to say, if Chamberlain goes, who would be the next person uh, to take over? And the, the, the offer is put, would Churchill serve under Halifax? Uh, and Churchill, according to Churchill, hesitates. He bites his tongue, doesn't say anything. There's an awkward silence and Halifax's nerve goes, and he says, well, maybe he's not the right person to take over, Halifax, because he sits in the House of Lords, and it needs somebody with a different approach and a different idea. Maybe that could be Churchill. So that's the story that goes around, that Churchill's refusal to back Halifax is the reason why Halifax decides to step aside and allow Churchill to become Prime Minister. Interestingly, not everybody who's at that meeting agrees that that's how it goes, but that's how it's recorded. Yeah, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in that meeting. Mm. I can imagine it being a, a little bit more tense. What was the relationship like between Churchill and Halifax? Um, grudging respect. Okay. Grudging respect. Um, it's not that Churchill uh, disliked Halifax, who, who, who thought him uh, foolish, but he, he did believe his judgment at times was wrong about what was important and uh, understanding the mood of the nation or understanding what's the, the critical aspect of policy. Um, whereas Halifax had a, a greater command of detail and control and so on, whereas Churchill was much likely, more likely to go off in different directions, Halifax understood the, the, the specifics more. But Churchill's view was that at that particular moment you needed somebody who saw the bigger picture and the longer term, unlike Halifax. But why Churchill? It's not like he, he obviously had a very long military career. He's somebody who had been in politics for a very long time. But his record wasn't exactly a, a stellar history of amazing military decisions. I'm going to mention Gallipoli. Mm. I'm going to mention the fact that he can't reopen the Dardanelles. Mm. The fact that the entire shipment of the world's grain from Russia and Ukraine, of course a very pertinent thing to be talking about, mm. can't get through. These are difficult times for Churchill. Does that legacy just not make him completely knock him out of the running? Um, it would have done in other circumstances, but as a, the most significant voice in the late 1930s arguing against appeasement and the threat that Hitler and the Nazis posed to the UK and to France, that's what carries him through. That was he, his voice? Yes, and, it, it, and he'd worked very hard and lobbied long and hard about these issues, uh, and the rest of the Conservative Party and the government, the, na uh, the national government, were trying to talk him down and shut him up and right. so on. And Churchill was one of... There were others... 
but Churchill was the most significant voice arguing against that particular policy for greater rearmament, particularly in terms of air resources and so on. Chamberlain had, prior to May 1940, run a war cabinet, which was a larger war cabinet, of which the, uh, the uh, Organisation of the Defence of the UK and the war effort was only one part. When Churchill takes over, he narrows it all down and brings it down to a much smaller grouping of just five or six people. Key allies? With the chiefs. Not always, no, no. It, I mean, it's partly that, and he's very shrewd and he manipulates. Well, he didn't that like to be committee. disagreed with, did he? There was only a few generals that could really tell him what for. Yes, and that, that brings him into big conflict with people like Dill, who becomes the chief of the Imperial General Staff. Very important in May 1940, he's a much more bullish character, much more optimistic than his predecessor. And when he, he becomes chief of the Imperial General Staff, on the 26th, 27th of May, it's an important change in terms of the attitude of the Chiefs of Staff. But Churchill's position when he takes over um, is not so secure. So although he wants to be the controlling and dominant voice in what he creates in this, this Defence Committee, he cannot do it without uh, the consent of Halifax and Chamberlain, who have to stay in this group. Right. So Halifax is retained, Chamberlain is retained because he needs the Conservative Party. because. Oddly, Churchill becomes the Prime Minister, but he's not also the leader of the Conservative Party at that time. So he needs Halifax and Chamberlain on side. Sounds to me like he's a, a canny and cunning political mover who gets what he wants by making difficult decisions. And as we, we sit here in the Churchill War Rooms, as they're now called, is it those sort of characteristics that made him the perfect person to lead Britain through the war? Yes, and I think the meetings that took place in the War Cabinet meetings, the Defence Committee meetings in late May 1940 capture that essence of how those decisions were taken and Churchill's role in them. He's, he's often portrayed and seen as being this bulldog spirit character and we fight on to the end, come up to May, and it's all about the spirit and determination. There's much more going on. He's a much shrewder, as you say, canny political operator. And some of the manoeuvrings that take place in those meetings on the 26th, 27th, 28th of May, where the, the idea of perhaps Britain not carrying on with the war, um, Churchill is very clever at how he manipulates, brings people onto that defence committee, outmanoeuvres Halifax and so on. So what we see there is a very sharp political figure. But the bigger picture is what's impressive. It's not just about the bulldog spirit. Churchill's vision of where Britain goes from the, in the summer of 1940, how the war might play out, is crucially important because it's, there's a bigger idea that whatever deal you might do with Germany, how Britain might get out of the war in, in 1940, will not solve anything. Ultimately, he argues and believes that Britain has many of the, the key cards, even after the fall of France, the, the tacit and uh, economic support of America, even before the Americans come into the war. And by tapping those resources into the empire and the Commonwealth, Britain still has many cards still to play. Just because France is out of the war does not mean the game's over. And therefore, Britain's best option, strategically and politically, is to carry on fighting. That you're not going to get a better deal as, uh, by coming to terms with Germany in the summer of 1940. And that's kind of interesting. It's not just about bulldog spirit and determination. There's more to it than that. So this, this period in time is what we call Britain's darkest hour. And Churchill decides that we're going to fight on, and that's with Britain most certainly under threat. Operation Sea Line is still in play, Hitler's plans to invade Britain. Mm. What are Churchill's options that are before him? What could he have done to keep Britain in the war effort? Um, at the, the time when key choices are made about whether Britain should carry on fighting or not, uh, is the, the backdrop is the beginnings of the Dunkirk evacuation. Everything's gone horribly wrong on the continent. The French are trying to get out of the war. Uh, Churchill's negotiating with Paul Rayner. So what is the next step? How can France get out of the war? So what are Britain's uh, uh, options at that time? And that's really the crux of those debates at that time. Halifax brings the idea that perhaps it's gone so badly wrong that Britain needs to cut its losses, go with what they can secure uh, and, and get out of the peace. war and do some kind of deal. Because we know that Germany goes on then to defeat France and it takes many more weeks and it's a really bitter fight in France. Um, it's played down a lot in the UK and there's the idea that the French should throw the towel in 1940, it's clearly not the case. They fight bitterly to keep the Germans out. Something like 90,000 French soldiers die 
in the campaign in 1940. It's often the case that, that, that people say, you know, France falls in six weeks, they must not have put up a fight. Mm. But the fact of the matter is, is that Blitzkrieg was just so powerful and no one expected it mm. that the French fell much, I expect, like many nations would have at that period in time. Yes, and, and the, uh, the, the French are still fighting whilst these decisions are uh, being made. Um, and there's a debate, do you keep France in the war? Do you let them drop out of the war? What kind of deal can the French get out of it? But it's also there's an element that the success of the German attack in the West has caught everybody by surprise, the Germans themselves. Um, and so how you assess that situation, the pressures that were playing at that time, um, the different information coming in, how people in late May in the, the cabinet war rooms are putting the pieces together to say what are the best options. It's all happening with repeated meetings, three meetings a day of the Defence Committee and the War Cabinet being drawn in, um, repeatedly having to reinvent the situation because things are changing. It's a really um, dynamic atmosphere, but one in which the future of Britain's role in the war and perhaps the West's role in the war is being played out. How does France get out of the war? Can Britain survive? And a, a key moment comes when the, the chiefs of staff produce a paper in which they state that Germany will, could well struggle to get control of the airspace over the UK because the RF is relatively strong in terms of defence and so forth, and that the Royal Navy is a major barrier to anything the Germans might want to do. So that means that the next few months it is quite possible that Britain would be able to survive even if France surrenders. What happens after that is still open to question and um, bringing the Americans into the war and some kind of support of some kind from the wider global perspective will be critically, critically important. Um, but it's not the end of the game and Churchill uses this to start to draw the War Cabinet and the Defence Committee over to his way of thinking. And one of the shrewdest moves he makes um, is that in the later stages of these discussions, this, this small group, he, he goes out there to the wider War Cabinet where he has bigger support and calls upon them and they all rally behind the Churchillian view that you must carry on the war. And he takes that back into the, the Defence Committee meetings and Halifax folds at that point and sees that there is no prospect uh, being able to push this and he doesn't resign, he stays in it because he sees that the weight of opinion both within the, the Defence Committee and the wider war cabinet is to carry on with the war. It's easy for us to sit here and to praise Churchill and to say that was the right decision. I mean in many ways Britain certainly won the war but what would have peace looked like at that time? What, what if we can go into a counterfactual, mm. say Halifax had got his own way and Hitler had agreed for, for peace with, with Britain, what, what would Britain's place have been in the world? How would the world have been divided? How would have Europe been divided? It's obviously it's always very difficult to play counterfactual games, but that's kind of the idea. Put yourself in those positions, think about the outcomes. It allows you to reflect upon the actual choice that was made and why it's important or interesting that it plays out in that way. The alternatives actually are, are worse. However bad Britain's position is in 1940, the, the alternatives don't really play out particularly well. If Halifax had become Prime Minister, for example, what choices would he have made? It would have been a wider war cabinet. People like Sam Hoare and uh, John Simon would have still been in the, the cabinet and they were appeasers and didn't get on with Churchill at all. There could have been a greater move for potentially doing a deal with Italy and, and Germany at that point, or uh, Germany through Italy. Um, the consequence of that, well, France would still probably have been partitioned. Um, Britain would probably have had to give up some uh, territorial concessions to Italy. There's talk of them giving up Malta and Gibraltar, uh, possibly Egypt and so forth in order to get Italy to act as these arbitrators to get Germany to call. So call giving off. up Malta, Gibraltar and Egypt to Italy? Yes. That, which would have lined in with Mussolini's plans who wanted to recreate the Roman Empire. Yes, I mean that's what Italy is about. Italy was willing to act, act as an honest broker, in inverted commas, only if the British and the French bought them off. And that, it, the French hoped it would have uh, prevented a complete German occupation of France, or any kind of German occupation of France, and the British, it would have meant that they could do a deal and stop the war in the West um, before everything really fell apart. And it's still a, a threat, there's still a perception that the Germans could strike at Britain. So you, you can see the environment in which this thinking is taking place. Halifax's view and others was that he didn't necessarily agree that that would be what would play out, 
but at least explore the possibility of using such negotiations to bring that stage of the war to an end. The trouble is, John, is that Britain is still in a weak position at this moment in time, and it looks weak to the United States. So how does Churchill, once he has consolidated power, how does he get Britain out of its darkest hour? You've got to think that as we move through 1940 and 1941, he sat here in this very building with bombs going off ahead. And you can paint it as much as you like that there's a blitz spirit, but Britain is under threat. So how does Churchill get us out of this? Churchill provides security of purpose to those around him and he's, he's driving power in government and how decisions are made and the famous notes he puts on the uh, documents, action this day and so on. That energy and dynamism is what drives British policy and st strategic thinking through that particular period. And um, those around him who at times question kind of his mercurial nature that he sometimes goes off message or goes off in all different directions and so on, nonetheless see that that's crucial in driving things forward. And it's important for Britain, um, um, uh, for Churchill to portray the country as being one united and having that strength despite the realities of what's going on around them. There's the bombing in London, there's a bombing around the country, um, the severe economic pressure, uh, the battle of the Atlantic started to go really bad. That's deliberate at that time. economic pressure. As we come to this point, this kind of it's a period of history that I think has been forgotten. The mm. battle of the ports and the industrial cities. Mm. There is pressure here by the Luftwaffe mm. to bomb the major industrial sites mm. and to really stop Britain getting its protein and its resources through to starve us out of the war. Yes. And all of this is kind of kept a little bit secret from Roosevelt, I think. Yes, I mean, it's very important that the for Britain to portray itself as being a good bet to the Americans. If the Americans are going to invest, if they're going to um, devise schemes such as Lend-Lease and um, uh, the 50 destroyers and so on and so forth, that Britain doesn't show signs of weakness. So the Americans think this is worthwhile. They're going to get a return on their investment. Even if they don't have to fight, the British are going to hold the, the Germans in check in some kind of way and control them. Um, so you're not going to get that kind of response from the United States if you show weakness. So a lot of the difficulties at times are played down as a demonstration of unity of purpose that the country's together. It's questionable as to how much together it was. The different people reacted differently to the, the conditions of 1940-41. Um, but the, the, the way in which the Germans then abandoned the idea in the autumn of 1940 of a direct invasion switched to this blockade and isolation and neutralization of Britain through the bombing of ports, through the att attacks on industries, and cities and towns and things in whatever manner they, they, they can. It, I mean, it doesn't achieve much in this kind of the economic effects directly, but the perception is important, how that is managed. Um, and particularly as well with the, the closing of the ports and the routes into and out of Britain, which is what Germany's trying to do with the U-boats and the aerial campaign and so on against ports and the, the, the routes through the Western approaches. Arguably, if Britain comes closest to losing the Second World War is in that winter when the U-boats are strangling so much of the, uh, the trade getting into and out of Britain, bringing in resources and food and so on, and the losses that the British are suffering in the Atlantic uh, are hugely significant and they can't manage those losses for very long. And so for a few months, Britain is teetering on the brink. Um, and at the same time, you've still got to be portraying a position of strength to the United States and the wider world and the Dominions, of course, who are providing much in resources and personnel to carry on the fight. How do you make them believe that Britain can actually get through that? Um, obviously, Churchill's speeches and so on are obviously identified as being a, a crucial part of that. But there's more to it in terms of portraying Britain as a good bet, demonstrating, despite the realities of the, the difficulties Britain is confronting at that time, that Britain can actually get through that, that period. But there is also um, a, a belief that by targeting Germany through bombing, this subversion idea and blockade, right. you'll weaken Germany to the point at which you'll start to bring down the whole edifice that it's not really uh, a state with strong roots and that democracies have got greater capabilities and a military dictatorship uh, will, is inherently flawed and will fall apart when you put great pressure on it. Now, that strategy, that grand vision that the, the British under Churchill developed in September 1940 is not one actually they truly believe that it's going to work. Churchill's wider vision is that they're going to have to draw on the United States at some point right. um, and other allies. 
and the and the the persisting strategy i think it's called where you you hang on in the hope that something's going to happen you make your position as strong as it can be you make your defensive position secure um, but basically you wait for the enemy to make a mistake it happened in the past with napoleon and so on now you're waiting for hitler to make a mistake and the 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 weakness is in the inherent contradictions of the Nazi state and Hitler's decision-making command structures mean they are probably going to make a mistake. And he's absolutely right, they do, a whole string of them. Invasion of the Soviet Union without being prepared, declaring war in the United States. Suddenly everything changes. And it's Churchill's role in getting to that position which is fundamentally important in terms of understanding its impact and importance to the way the Second World War plays out. So Churchill's political wrangling his place within the establishment for a long time. He knows it inside out. He knows how to perhaps manipulate it ever so slightly. His relationship with the United States, but also his grand vision and being able to see how the British Empire works and how it all pieces together and what you need to make Britain survive. All of these make Churchill the perfect wartime leader, the right leader at the right time. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.